Today I've brought you to Hawcroft Fishery. It's not a venue I know loads about, but one thing I do know is there's some cracking carp in here. It's absolutely freezing cold, but we're gonna be doing a bit of bomb fishing. So yes, the weather's freezing, I don't wanna get my kit out, but we're fishing a tactic that's suited to this time of year. So one thing I will say, location is gonna be key. So rather than just picking a swim and sitting down, we're gonna have a little bit of a drive, a little bit of a look with our eyes and keep an eye on that surface, see if we can find some fish, because if we can find them, I'm pretty sure we can catch them. Without doubt, the most important part of carp fishing in the cold is location. You can have the best rigs, best bait, but if you're not sitting on the carp, you're not catching them. They're not gonna swim halfway around a lake to get to your bait. You've got to find them. So there's two ways you can do this. Firstly, look at some match results, look for the winning pegs, look for a little area where there was a few fish. Secondly, and one I like to do myself is use your eyes. Carp move, so match results might say one thing one day, those carp can move. They might be at the, move off the wind, might move into the wind. So I always like to have a look round. Take today, we're on the moat pool. I was here two weeks ago and there was a big ball of carp that I found on peg 100. So I've got a little bit of prior info, but I still use my eyes and I've had a good look. Uh, it's a little bit windy today, so it's not easy to see. What I'm looking for when I say visually is bubbles or fish topping. Fish topping is mega obvious. If you see one carp top, there'll be another 100 underneath. You know, I mean, that might be a slight exaggeration, but carp don't swim around in the cold on their own. So if you see one top, there's fish there. That's gonna be a good area to sit in. The other thing is bubbles. A couple of little bubbles I've seen today and they've been on sort of 101. So my thinking is those fish, they haven't moved far. They were on 100 two weeks ago. I think they're in between that area today and hopefully we're gonna catch a few. And there's only one way we're gonna find out. first thing to consider on a day like this is where to cast at the start. Now the biggest mistake a lot of anglers make is they'll get to the peg, they'll have seven or eight chucks with a lead on just to get a feel of what's in front of them, maybe look for liners or just get a clip on. The problem is when you're sat on your own the fish can back off so the more disturbance you make when it's cold the water's quite clear it's freezing those carp aren't going to want to feed so when they don't want to feed you make lots of disturbance when there's no anglers either side of you fish swim off and they're out of range all of a sudden. So they're out your swim. So you're facing a day whereby you've started on a few fish, but you quickly spooked them out the swim. So the secret for me is there's going to be, there's a ball of carp out there. There's going to be a ball. What I don't want to do, because I want to maximize how many casts I get at these carp before I spook them. So what I don't want to do is cast straight into the ball, maybe catch two fish and they'll swim 10 pegs off to my left. So they're gone. Instead, I want to make my first cast as short as possible, so there's less line in the water, but at the same time, far enough to give myself a chance of a fish. So I think the fish, at the minute, are slightly to my left. Uh, this is my theorising from what I've seen. Slightly to the left, and maybe virtually bang down the middle. So I'm going to start straight in front of me, uh, and slightly what I call slightly short of the middle. I reckon that's going to be, there's a chance of an odd fish being on the edge of the ball. So that's going to give me a chance of a bite. I'm not going to leave it out too long. Let's just drop it out there while we're talking. So literally I'm going to go straight in front of me. But I'm not going to leave it in very long. But I'm trying to start as short as I can. And I'm getting liners already. Uh, without going what into cutting to the ball. I'm pretty sure the bulk of that ball is to the left. Now, this type of fish in, I am going to get a lot of liners and if you can see that tip now I'm already getting a few which suggests maybe the balls move slightly this way but equally it's a sit on your hands job got bread popped up 30 centimeters off the lead that's my starting option I've then got to work out where the fish are it might be they only want to pick a bait up off the bottom or it might be I need to pop up slightly higher but I'll get a feel for that as we go along but 
I'm now confident, I'm not going to clip up, but I'm chucking where there's fish. You can see that there, and I think that might be, yeah, that's on. If you can see that, I've waited an extra second just to make sure it's on, because you do get big liners, and what I don't want to be doing is striking at those liners. If you start striking at liners, you, you risk spooking the shoal, and again, they'll move away. Fishing at this time of year is great when you're on them, but if you spook them, because there's no one else on the lake, in summer, no one on the lake is brilliant. Carp come to you, you feed them down the edge. In winter, the carp won't come to you. Uh, and if you spook them away from where they want to be, they won't come back. And then they're out, you swim, and you might, you've either got to move or just pack up. So it's really important to maximise every single chuck. You know, it's rare you get a first chuck as good as that one. One thing I will say is, well, I don't clip up on the basis I'm not feeding anything. So it's all about sort of chucking about, looking for fish. If I catch a fish, like I've just had, I'll go back to the same area next chuck. Don't need to be on a sixpence though. I'm not building a swim. So I will go back to the, the same area next cast, but if I don't get a sign next cast, because the ball will move throughout this session, the ball will move. It might go left, it might go right, it might go a bit further out. The secret is to try and stay in touch with those fish. No rush at this time of year either. It's not a case of like trying to get back in as quick as possible. It's a case if you walk a fish, let's make sure we land it and then get back, worry about getting back out. Look like a, a decent mirror. There are some big fish in this lake though as well. Like up to sort of 20 pound and like 15 pounders aren't uncommon. A nice soft action rod is important for this type of fishing as well but I'll run you through tackle a little bit later on. Let's just try and get this first fish in the net and a nice settler, as they say. It's definitely woke up a bit since that first time it come to the surface. Still can't get over how quick that was. Just goes to show how important location is. I honestly believe if I went sort of six, five, six pegs either side, I wouldn't get a bite. It's always important to take your time with every fish, but that first fish is a real settler. And it can sort of set the tone, if you excuse the pun, for the rest of the day. And that's a lovely mirror. Well, you don't get a better start than that on a cold winter's day. Really good looking fish, probably, don't know, six pound, but a great start and hopefully the first of many. Unless I've got any preconceived information, my starting bait this time of year, when it's freezing cold, carp aren't really feeding, will always be bred. First thing about bread is it's white. Water's clear, it's high vis. The second thing, and I think possibly the, the thing that makes bread stand out and is massively attractive is, once it's been in the water, it softens up. So it takes minimal effort for carp to eat it. Also, when it softens up, it puffs up. So basically it's a bigger hook bait. So it's a big, bright, white hook bait, sticking up off bottom. Carp can see it, something really visual, and they home in on it. As for how I fish it, punch size, Three bits of 10 mil punch. You can vary how many bits you put on. I personally would never put one on. Some people will put four or five on. For me, three is the optimum number. So three bits of 10 mil punch. Uh, bread wise, take your pick. What I'll say is a thick, white, a very soft, spongy type bread. Warburton's is brilliant. The orange bag, probably the most famous for fishing. So all I do before I'm gonna punch it, just compress it with my finger. 10 mil punch, one bit, two bit, three bits, then literally squeeze the three discs out like so. And I've got, I'll just drop the disc there, size 12 QM1, nice big hook, big fish, big hook is my motto. Little speed stop, push the speed stop through the three discs like so. Turn the speed stop round and then I've got the, the three discs on the hair. Little tip when you're hair rigging bread, and that is to always leave sort of like, 
almost like half a centimetre up to a centimetre gap between the bread and the bend of the hook. So it's a much longer hair. When I have it like that, to me, that looks like the hair's slightly too long. But what you've got to bear in mind is the bread's going to expand once it's in the water. So that gap will disappear. If you start on a normal length hair rig when you're bread fishing, uh, once that bread starts to expand in the water, your hook gets kicked off at a funny angle and you can get sort of aborted bite. So longer hair than normal, sort of half a centimetre up to a centimetre between that top bread disc and the back of the bend. That's about perfect. So that's the hook bait. Let's get it back out. Tackle for bomb fishing is nice and simple. Firstly, I want a relatively short rod. The maximum distance I'm going to be casting on a venue like Hallcroft or most commercial fisheries is 40, 50 metres. And with a bomb, the 10 foot engaged feeder will do that no problem. But it's also got quite a nice soft action. So it's forgiving when you play fish, but a little bit of power in the butt for casting. So the 10 foot engaged feeder rod. Quiver tip is one ounce, which to some watching this will seem a little bit light. But bomb fishing for me is all about indications and knowing where the fish are. So light quiver tip, fish nice and slack. I don't want a, a bowstring line running through the swim with the tip locked right round. So slack tip, one ounce quiver, so I can see all those little line bites, which you could hopefully tell me where the fish are. Main line, six pound Pulse Pro on a 4,000 Aventus reel. My actually setup itself is dead simple. Just literally nice little running rig. I've got snap link swivel down to a speed bead. The speed bead just acts as a buffer. So it's nice and simple running rig. The rules here do dictate you have to fish a running rig, but this is a rig I'd quite happily use on any venue in the cold. So speed bead, which gives me the ability to quick change my hook length. Again, something that's really important with this style of fishing. I might want to have a chuck on a wafter, then I might want to put a long hook length on with popped up bread or whatever. And that just allows me to do that without having to sort of cut my hook length off and put a new one on. So I'm not ruining hook lengths every time I make a change. On the subject of hook lengths, I tie up several different ones for this type of fishing. I've got 75 centimetres, uh, basically a long hook length for a wafter. What I'm a big believer in is visibility. So a slow falling hook bait. I don't believe short hook lengths on the bomb are the one unless I'm popping up directly off the lead. So long hook length, 75 centimetres, I can shorten that. That's like 017 is my sort of standard. 017 N gauge is my standard line for carping, size 12 QM1. And I've got a variety of different hook lengths depending on what I'm going to be doing. But for carp, they're all on 017. The only, most of them have got QM1s. The only difference one, and this is my sort of like, if it's really tough and I feel like the fish are just watching the hook bait, size 14 Super LWG, 017, 50 centimetres, and I'll just hair rig a wafter on that, but I trim it. Just trim it down so it's just sinking nice and slowly under the weight of the hook. And often that'll get a couple of bites on those hard days when everything else is failing. So nice and simple. One other subject I will mention that's really, really important, and that's lead size. There's nothing worse when the water's freezing cold and clear than crashing a great big lead in. So the lightest lead I can get away with to reach the fish is what I'll go with. So it might be as light as a third of an ounce. Bear in mind, I've got six pound Pulse Pro on the reel, very low diameter line, makes casting easy. So light leads, feather it in, little plop, keep that disturbance to a minimum, and that's gonna hopefully keep those fish in the area a little bit longer. Well, that first fish, was a little bit of a false dawn, so to speak, because I think hooking it, playing it, etc., spooked the ball, so to speak, because I've gone an hour of literally odd little indication, well, not little indication, odd big liner. And then I've come off the bread, switched to a little six mil yellow wafter, chucked a bit to the left, just to try and relocate that ball. I have been casting about a bit, because, oh, it's a cracking fish. Because if you're not getting bites at this time of year, it's important. The fish aren't going to come to you on a fishery like this. You've got to find the fish. That's an absolutely immaculate mirror. That's got to be the best part of double figures. Just shows as well, oh, when they're as big as that, 
you don't need many for a weight. Cracking fish, lovely scaly mirror, and proof that little change in location, I've literally only moved, you know, in landscape sort of seven, eight meters to the left, change your hook bait to a little six mil slow sinking wafter, and we've got this beauty. A really important aspect to this type of fishing is how often should I be casting? Now, one of the issues you've got is, if there's a load of fish in front of you and the lake's empty like I've got today, to a degree, the more I cast, the more I'm likely to push the fish out of the swim. That said, when you're single hook bait fishing, as I am today with either wafter, bread, etc., I'm totally reliant on dropping it in front of the fish. So my rule of thumb is stopwatch. If I go in and I get, so, get signs ind indications, I'm quite happy to leave that in for sort of 15, 20 minutes, no problem. Because I know my bait's in and around fish and there's a good chance of it getting picked up. If I cast out and after five minutes, I've not had an indication, no movement on the tip at all, then to me, that's long enough to tell me I'm not in the right spot. So it's time for a move. I won't go back to the same spot twice if, if I've not had an indication. So five minutes without sign, I'll reel in, and then I might go five meters left, five meters right, five meters further, or even two meters further. What I won't do, I always pick markers. So when I cast, I'll be like, right, that cast went in line with that tree, roughly halfway. And then I know if I get a bite, I can get back to that spot without using a line clip. But say I went to that tree, halfway across, no signs. There's no point going on the same line five meters shorter because I've had no indications. That pretty much tells me there's no fish between my rod top and the bomb. So if I want to repeat the tree line, it's five meters further. But normally what I like to do before I go further, I'll go five meters left, five meters right, and then follow the fish out. What I don't want to do is go past the fish and then I have to come back because that can split them and push them out of the swim altogether. So let the fish decide almost how long you're going to leave the bomb in. Like I said, if there's signs, be patient. 20 minutes is not a problem, even with bread. But if there's no signs, you've got to find those fish, so go looking for them. another fish on I think this is going to be the last one of the day it's, it's been tough to be honest but there's been just enough bites by working at things to keep it interesting and obviously the fit stamp of fish is brilliant and when this last fish has come sort of on the limit of my peg to the left it's definite throughout the session the fish started in front of me and I thought they'd go right to get out the wind but as it happens, they've dropped down to the left. So I've probably caught this one 15 meters to the left of where I caught that first fish. The other comment I'll make as well is, this one's on the bread. I'm pretty confident the fish haven't wanted to be on bottom. I have clipped a couple. When, I found, when I've got back in touch with the fish, when they, they have kept moving all the time, I've clipped a couple. When you cast out and hold the line sort of tight as the bomb's falling, I felt it like plink one which tells you again, they're sat up, maybe not moving much. I mean, that first fish I had on bread was on a 30 centimetre hook length, but I'd say 50 has been better, as though they're that little bit higher. I think it's another decent fish to be fair as well. But my honest belief is, had I, oh, that's a cracking fish. If I'd just cast in the same, that is massive. If I'd just cast in the same spot all day, I'd probably have one fish which just goes to show you how effective moving is, trying to keep in touch with that ball. And you get rewards like this hippo. That is a massive common with an even bigger mouth. Well, let me just hold this one up. This one certainly surprised me. I never thought it was that big when I was playing it. And when it popped up and I saw that mouth in front of me, I couldn't wait to get it in the net. So yes, it's been hard, but there's been bites to be had and proof if you needed it, that location is key. If you're not on top of the carp this time of year, 
you're not going to catch them. So yes, fishing's hard, but when the carp look like this one, it's all worthwhile. <laughs>